Um, welcome back to Rasm Afsar TV. Uh, today, I'm very, very happy to have a special friend of mine, Marco, Marco Quarta, whom I met um, in the United States. Well, welcome, Marco, to Rasm Afsar TV channel. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure and an honor to you know, contribute to this uh, exceptionally good channel you know, of martial arts culture. Thank you very much, Marco. Marco, could you please tell our viewers who you are? Maybe we start about your educational background and your profession, what you do, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's say I'm a scientist by training, as a, first of all. Um, I have a PhD in, age, in neuroscience and aging um, and doctoral degrees in uh, bioengineering biotechnologies. Um, so I'm a scientist, I, and I, as an academic, I do research here at the, in the United States at Stanford University, working on a number of different aspects and mostly physiology and um, regenerative medicine. Uh, I do also research uh, in collaboration with other academics in martial arts as well, especially in, again, biomechanics, physiology, and aspects that specifically my interest is how traditional martial arts have um, an impact or they actually are uh, the efficacy of certain movements and the impact on the body. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that later. Um, that's a little bit on a nutshell. I trained and studied uh, in Italy, where I'm from originally, and I moved here in 2008. Um, I'm also uh, more recently in the past few years, I'm, I'm more as an entrepreneur because I started a couple of biotech companies here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we are developing therapeutics targeting the aging uh, with the goal of, of treating age related diseases and extend health span and lifespan. Um, and that's you now currently I'm CEO of one of those companies. Uh, as I continue being an academic and doing research uh, at the university as well. So that's a little bit myself. I have to say I have a background but past in, in my back in the days while I was still like studying. I also I did, a, let's say, a break where I was a police officer and worked uh, for, uh, for a while in the SWAT team in Italy. Ah, in Italy. Okay, interesting, interesting. Biotechnology is one of the most... Uh, interesting and rewarding fields to be. Am I correct to say that? One of, yeah, it's certainly an exciting field. Um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, my personally, I've been always been intrigued by this idea of aging and how we can change uh, the trajectory of how we age, right? And in a way, martial arts has a lot to do about it. Uh, keep your body healthy and strong and flexible for longer. Uh, so the idea is really not to uh, live longer. The idea is to live uh, healthy as long as possible, right? And, that, and first things is like keeping your, your body active and eating well. But now, you know, there are therapeutically, there are ways that we can target the aging biology. Uh, that is the main cause of all age-related diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, diabetes. They all happen after a certain age. And they're all connected. So we now have the science is developed enough that we can now think about treating aging almost as a disease and cure the diseases that happen following that. But I'm a strong advocate. I mean, before taking a pill, you should really have to take care of yourself. And I think good practice, and I think martial arts historically showed how it can really keep you healthy and strong for a long time. Fascinating, really fascinating subject. I think, Marco, I'm going to, if you agree, invite you specifically for this topic another time, because I, it's so fascinating, uh, because we have also lots of researchers here talk about their research, and I would love to talk about it. Today, uh, Marco, I'm fascinated, and I also talk to Greg and to many other friends, mutual friends we have, and then I always say, my God, Marco is doing great research. You are in a great <laughs> research area. Okay, Marco, let's go back to your martial arts background. When did you start with martial arts, please? Yeah, um, it's funny that, you know, as long as I remember, you know, I, I, when I was a little kid, I remember me saying that I want to become a few things. I had very clear in my mind. I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a warrior, a fighter, 
and um, and a wizard, but that's a different story. You know? <laughs> uh, anyway, and I've been pursuing uh, those things, you know, really actively. So my first, I start my first lab. I was a little seven, seven years old. I put things together in my room and started to experiment. I'm a scientist in the family, a medical doctor, but at the same time, I also started to study martial arts. And probably the first person I learned from is actually my dad. Um, he's a retired now uh, general of the Italian aviation. And, uh, you know, he had some training there. But so he was supportive about me learning those things. My mom was less. And so, um, uh, and I started with, you know, Asian Japanese martial arts in particular as a little kid. I started with judo, like many others, uh, which is a beautiful art in many ways. And I continued, you know, studying Japanese, you know, jiu-jitsu for many, many years, uh, where I uh, achieved the third Dan Black Belt rank as when I was in my, I don't remember, early 20s, probably something like that. And so I started very early. Um, and of course, I started to explore, like many of us, many as as I was growing, many many other martial arts, uh, with or without weapon, many Asian martial arts. Um, so I'm not listing it. You know, more recently, when I came to US, of course, I wanted to study more the local martial arts, some MMA. And so, of course, I, I studied with a, a, a Gracie Jiu Jitsu Academy for a, for a few years and did a bunch of other things. So, really, the idea of exploring and it's like many of us, you really want to be as comprehensive as possible and learning. But probably my strongest in the Asian martial arts background was really into more uh, uh, Nipponic Japanese martial arts and Jiu Jitsu probably is my, uh, my, my strength there. However, um, as I was doing that, uh, it, probably the very first time I was exposed to Italian martial arts, I was still a little kid. I was playing with my cousins south in the south of Italy, in Apulia. Um, and at that time, I didn't know, no? there were these games that you do, you play with little sticks and um, you kind of touch. And, and then there are these sort of forms of wrestling and stuff. But at that time, you know, I, I was telling my parents, I want to do real martial arts, right? So I want to. And for that, I didn't realize that what I was actually learning was part of my own culture. There were martial arts in Italy, but it's only later as a teenager when I, again, in my exploration, I started to do fencing, Olympic fencing, um, that starts something triggering in my mind. And I said, actually, wait a minute, this thing used to be a weapon, used to be a sword, right? No, it's a, it's a sport, but what am I doing? I'm learning something that was done for dueling. So I said, okay. And then, you know, at that time I was doing some like, uh, like a Greek Roman wrestling and pugilism, a boxing. And I said, wait a minute, you know, this stuff used to be for battle. You know, this is a sport. So I said, how did this start? You know, so that triggered my curiosity. And, uh, and I was in the 90s around that, and uh, like mid 90s or something. Like that. And that back then is when I connected with a group of people in Italy who had the same inspiration or idea, right? They started to explore and come, all coming from different background martial arts and really saying, wait a minute, but how about our own culture? You know, the Mediterranean has been historically in, like, in war for millennia. So we must have martial arts, right? And indeed we do. Now, now the, everybody knows the legacy of those, which is a sport, like again, fencing, boxing, wrestling. It's a modern legacy of what used to be martial arts. And uh, indeed, you know, if, you, if you look at the a dictionary of the 17, 1800, when initially it was also created, but even the early uh, 19, uh, 20th centuries, and for example, you look under fencing, the definition is a martial arts, you know, who's, uh, you know, developed by some early schools uh, in Italy, like the Achille Marozzo, it's a Bolognese school, and uh, used for dueling, da, 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 is also a sport. That was what you can read in a fairly modern dictionary. If you do that today, it's not, right? It is a sport now. But that suggests it's not too long ago that this reality was there. So we put forces together and I, 
I came with a certain background and I started to explore also some of the you know, traditional, popular, regional arts, the arts, for example, of use of knife and sticks and an arm. Um, and also it opened to me, that, you know, in joining with this group that later be will become what we, we call Nova Scrimia, yeah, which we founded in 1999. And is really a sort of a brotherhood of people who put the effort of um, continuing and both like resurging, protecting, and uh, uh, educating uh, the Italian arts, Italian martial arts. And the name Nova Scrimia, again, Nova means new, Scrimia is a Renaissance term for scherma, uh, which means the art of protection of, of shielding. Schermo means shield. Um, or in English is fencing, which the name probably comes more about you know, the arts of uh, playing into a fence. That is more like the tournament, but probably is more the, the French version of what actually they created the games in the 1800s. They reinvented the modern Olympic games and the modern idea of sport. And indeed, for a long time, there was this friction between the Italian school and the French school. The Italian school has more this idea of well, this is not to play. No, this is something that you do for, for battle, as opposed to, well, this is something that the aristocrats can do and it's good for your health and it, you can play and you don't have to be, you know, risk yourself and get injuries. And that there is this idea. But, um, but that's, so we put together the effort and we realized there is, you know, there are living arts that so, still are taught on the traditional way. And, but there are also a huge body of literature, manuscripts and, and centuries of documentations that you can go back and try to rediscover some of those things. So, so that we did for decades now in the Nova Scrimia, um, I, you know, everyone somehow took his own spe specialty and focused on studies. Um, and later on, I would say then this idea of you know, rediscovering and uh, um, studying this historical European martial arts came out, but um, I probably not really identified like that specifically. Um, I think my, my drive has always been looking for uh, living arts, things that you can learn from someone who learned from someone else and maybe use this as a framework to then help you navigating historical research that can kind of patch the areas, gray areas, and use this again as a genome of what that could be moving. But we need to be aware that whatever we do in historical arts that died over time or evolved to a point that we cannot go back, will always be limited to an interpretation, right? So- Absolutely. Um, so, but that's a little bit about me and, and you say my, my background. And so since then I focus more and more in Italian martial arts and I, slowly also for lack of time and my job became more and more demanding I decided to focus uniquely in that um, so I, I, I started at a school back in Bologna where I was and then in Padova and I moved later in Italy to do my PhD and then when I came here at Stanford I opened a chapter at the university here as part of the Stanford Martial Arts program where I was teaching workshops and classes and and eventually we open now a school, uh, joining a school of European Italian martial arts. Uh, yeah, it's focused on Italian martial arts, but not only, let's say Hemas here in Santa Clara in the Bay Area where we have regular classes, we have our own instructors and we teach Italian martial arts. And we invite, um, you know, masters from different families or traditions in Italy to come here and teach to, uh, to people. Because again, with the idea of promoting as much as possible, and the awareness that there is a culture in Italy of arts that's still alive, there are still living traditions, um, as, as well as an historical component that is beautiful and very complex and sophisticated, but it, it remains more an, an exercise of reconstruction in that sense. Could you just tell us a bit about the living arts, a bit, uh, what kind of schools are they? What do they teach? What weapons they teach? So. Yeah, so in terms of living arts, and it was fascinating to me when I, the more, the deeper I was going into my exploration, the more shocking was, even as an Italian, discovering my own culture and say how complex and rich Italy could be and how many things can offer. 
And so, you know, historically, I'm not opening that chapter, but, you know, the complexity of how even Italy is, has been always a very fragmented country, has been unified as a republic very recently, right, in 1800. But historically, it's always been divided in subculture. You know, we have so many dialects that are completely different languages. You can even speak between dialects sometimes, right? Um, different food tradition, architecture, and so many influences from all the Mediterranean uh, over millennia. So I have to say probably the Romans, as they expanded and, you know, through, through the Republican empire, uh, their, um, their politics back then was to maintain local cultures. So it was a sort of form of conquer based on first war and then uh, trading, commercial and political tradings, right? So that that means that like even within Italy, all the pre-Indo-European uh, or certainly pre-Roman um, culture, the uh, Latini presence there, they retain their identities. Indeed, the, the regions in Italy uh, still have the name of the even some mythological or anyway the the the, the uh, local Italian populations before Italy was unified. Uh, so the Liguria, where Genova is, it, it comes from the Liguri, or the, the Veneto, where the Venice is from the Eniti, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So that means that you know, this culture remains somehow preserved or somehow distinguished over over centuries. And even today, you know, I mean, maybe things are slowly changing for good or bad, but, you know, when you go from one town to another, even if it's very close, so mentally people say, oh, why do you go over there? That's a different place, mentally. It's like 10 minutes drive, but it's a different place. Those people there. And, and I, had, I came in US with this idea, right, in mind. Here, you drive 16 hours and it's normal to, to see a friend, uh, you know, over there, <laughs> it's like very different. Um, but this retain identity of so many traditional cultures, including martial arts in that sense. So there are many that pre preserved and retain their identity over time. I'd say probably the most, I generally divide in different areas. In the South, uh, the ones that are preserved the most are arts of um, knife and stick, fighting and fencing. In different regions, some are, and I can, if you have, if you have time and if you want, I can talk a little bit more about that. But some yes. have very different identities, and then, and even you know, tech, technically, tactically, uh, how they're built around the philosophers around are very different. Um, you know, sometimes like I, I go in one region, I can tell a little bit more about Apulia, which is probably the one that I know the best, also because my family belongs to there. But uh, it's almost like being in China and find uh, you know, so different uh, Kung Fu, different schools, and <laughs> so different with each other, different philosophies, sometimes in war with each other. And that's like one town close to the next, again, 10 minutes away, and they're like completely different worlds. But those are still alive, you know, and they're still well preserved within families or within societies, within groups. And probably they're they've been like exposed to the public uh, awareness in the, more recently, maybe in the past 10, 15 years, some with hesitation, some a little bit more, but, um, but this is definitely very lively culture and very, very rich. And I, I can tell a little bit more of that. There is also an aspect of unarmed arts, um, several that some are connected with the use of knife and sticks. It's like, what do you do if you don't have it? And until you get it, or until you can take it from your opponent before he draw a knife on you, that changes the situation. But um, this is the idea that they come together. So mindset it is always not to as a ritual, but it's for like defending yourself in a possible situation where a weapon might come up at any time. So the mindset is changed, right? It's not like you can fight, face someone and take your time. Maybe there are rules, maybe there is a referee, but it's you might need to face someone in a fraction of a time before this person might take a weapon or someone else might show up with a weapon or behind. 
So there is that mindset, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, that's more on the south, but there are arts that are still also within other weapons that maybe are anachronistic, like related to swords. You don't walk around with the swords, you still can walk around with a stick or a knife. And that's one of the reasons why maybe they're, they're remain uh, alive, but there are different reasons, so I can talk more. Um, but there are still maybe people that teach how to use a sword, not for sport, but for dueling. There are families, there are examples of you know, generations of fencing masters that right now they teach Olympic fencing, but for generations in the family, they have been learning, you know, they have this culture within the family of that maybe there are fencing masters for like five, seven, eight generations. So we're back then and not too long ago, maybe three generations ago, uh, they were still do, uh, dueling, uh, dueling in first or last blood. And if you go back in time, it was certainly you know, more and more. Um, and those are still alive. You know? There are a few families in Italy that, and I know that they're, what they do today, they're still fencing masters. They teach within the Italian Federation of Fencing to kids, to Olympic teams, but they also have their own family tradition. Uh, the Manuzardi family, for example, Lorenzo Manuzardi, who learned from you know, his grandfather, who was a fencing master, and you know, his uncle and father. And back then, um, he's also a great musician, by the way, but he's a fencing master. And they have in a family a tradition of uh, stick fencing uh, and of like a boxing that in that area, they are in the area of uh, uh, Northeast. So there was a strong influence also with the French, uh, the French e evolution of the can and so, um, and the savat. And so it's a form of uh, pugilism that implies kicks and, uh, and punches as well as stick, but also dueling fencing, what is called spada da terreno. Uh, 